<clears throat> okay. I was uh, I was with A Troop, first of the first cab in Vietnam, 68, 69. I got there in the midst of Tet. If everybody knows what Tet was. Um, I was I came from Germany and I knew how to be a tank loader and I had to do different things on the tank, even though we had a different model. That um, I was there for nine months, got into all kinds of a fight with the NVA and the BC was no problem. It was the NVA that we would meet on the battlefield, try to be ambushed by them. They had the anti tank weapons. Well, on my last mission, I was in just a little over nine months. <clears throat> um, I was the platoon sergeant's gunner, by the way. We were on this one hill, Hill 39. I'll never forget it. It was a hill out in no man's land, in what we used to call Indian territory. Uh, that was occupied by RFs and PFs, which were basically the South Vietnamese National Guard. They, our squadron got word that they were going to march off this hill and leave cases and cases of bouncing Betty mines alone. And we knew that the NBA would pick them up and use them against us. So they sent my platoon out there. And we were out there six days. Every morning, we were waiting for actually these mines, these cases to be picked up by choppers, which we were on some schedule, it was going to take days for them to get there. Every morning, just as the sun came up, we would sweep for two or three miles around this hill. And we would sweep in a line, whatever tank, or an A cab, a tank, an A cab, A cab. And so if, if we made contact with the enemy, all our weapons were all facing one way, and we could get maximum firepower that way. Or if the whole line would have to shift, we would. The last morning we swept, we were, our platoon leader ordered us to sweep in a column, which is kind of like the you know, Navy with the battleships one behind each other. You can't get all your firepower one way. So we swept, and on my tank, being the platoon sergeant's gunner, our tank was the first tank in the column. And out in the rice paddies, it was dry season, no water in a rice paddy. You know, you're looking at the remains of a of, of rice crop and everything. We're going over these small dikes. And to our right and left is what we call hard ground, where the woods and the jungles were. Mm -hmm. And so basically we're sitting ducks, but this is how we operated. We only went into the hard ground when we had to, or into the jungle. And I'm sitting up there, leaning up against the cupola of the tank. Above my head was the caliber 50, my platoon saw was behind me. I had a, a brand new guy sitting to my left. His name was Richard Fisher from Indiana. And behind him was the loader of our tank, a guy named Grossman. He was from, our, um, from Long Island. He was an old guy just like me, been there long enough. I'm leaning up against, by the way, I, I had a German helmet on. I had a German helmet, chin strapped on, earphones underneath with the wire dangling. And all I had to do was the first shot, just routine, be inside the tank in the gunner's position and hook up the wire and I'd be on the controls listening to my tank commander, my platoon saw. A German helmet, by the way, my mom sent over from, um, from home, and my dad had picked it up in Hurricane Forest in World War II. Had a bullet hole next to the eagle. And I had asked my mom to send that helmet with some model paints and stuff. And um, from that point on, I had the helmet on steel, and I had uh, the earphones under my, uh, under my helmet. <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking out, the tank is going across the rice paddy. We leave the vehicle and the gun tubes over the right fender. We never put it over the driver in case you hit a mine. The driver would be blown up into the main gun and you'd be killed. So it was over the right fender. Tank behind us had it over the left fender. And so on, the vehicles. We had two scout vehicles on each side that were forward of us. And to this day, I'm in touch with the driver of the scout vehicle on our front left. He told me, he said, I, he said this is years later, I couldn't believe it. He said, the ground in front of me moved on this embankment. And he said, my brain is telling me that, that it's not moving. This, it's a hatch or something moving for something to happen. He said, a gun tube stuck out of that opening. And they fired. They didn't want that A-cab, that M113 with the gun shields. And everything. They, the round would pass their bore, their, their bow, right at us and hit us. We were being the lead tank. They wanted a tank that morning. And from my perspective, I was up there and I saw the scout vehicles coming. Looking out there, I saw a flash. Now, our drivers over there on our A-cabs and tanks were fast with RPGs. And RPGs were shot as our guys could 
to move fast, to tank left or right, whatever, to dodge it, you couldn't do it with a recoil rifle. It's, it's an anti-tank gun. Once it fires the rounds on, you're already. I'm leaning there and I saw the flash, and my brain's telling me, ah, recoil this rifle, before I can even think the thought, the round hit just below me and next to the, our new guy. <clears throat> I went up and onto the front fender of the tank, and I'm, in, in that instant, I heard him yell, scream. And I, all I could do was to roll around and on that fender. Now, I remember rolling off the tank and onto the, into the rice paddy with what was left of my clothes on fire. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do, uh, do you want to finish up the journey and switch off? Yes, please. If you, yes, if if you, may I switch, please, Bob. Sure, sure. I, I'd love. Yeah, I, go ahead. I want. I want to hear the end. Of, this is a good story. Okay, yeah. No, 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 no. no you keep filming. Okay. Um, I, I think we're filming now. You just have to edit this part out. Okay. You left with fault rolling off the fender into the rice oh, paddy with the clothes on fire. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay. Right. <clears throat> is that rolling right now? Yes, that's okay. right. Well, I was telling you, when that round hit my an angry cross rifle opened up on us, and our tank was the lead tank in the column. When that round hit, I was leaning up against the cupola, and with the M60 between my legs and the gun shield, when that round hit, I, I knew it wasn't an RPG because it, it has a different flash, and we have been shot at by RPGs before. There was nothing I could, by the next breath, the round had hit us, and I wound up. Going up in the air, I hit the, the fender of the tank, and I, I don't remember exactly how I hit the rice paddy. There was no water in the rice paddy, it was dry season. And, and my clothes were on fire, and I remember being on my back trying to get my pistol belt off. I had a 1911 on my right side, and I had a Model 10, 38 on my left side, which I bought for 50 bucks from a chopper pilot, because I was always worried if the 1911 wouldn't function with an NBA coming at me with a band, at least I have something else. Well, here I was in the rice paddy trying to get my belt off because all I could feel was fire underneath the belt. It wasn't until about six months ago, all these decades later, that the driver of our tank, which I tried once in a while to get in touch with him, found me. Chuck, his name was Chuck Barr from Philadelphia. He, he uh, sent a shotgun blast of uh, letters to all Bob Hurley's he could find, and he got me. Called, we talked to each other, he says, yes, that morning, he says, I don't know if you remember, but he said, when that round hit us, he said, first thing I thought was, we hit a mine. But he says, I glanced back into the back, into the turret basket, and everything was burning inside, I knew it wasn't a mine. He said, I turned the engine off quick, and I rolled out the front slope, and he said, I let the tank run over me. Now, on the M48, you have like a foot and a half space, if you traction on hard ground, and the paddies were dry, so it was hard now. He says, I crawled underneath the tank, I came to the back of the tank. He said, by then, the enemy was machine gun in the tank, bullets were bouncing off. He said, I, I was, I stood up behind the back, the back end of the tank. I looked up, he says, you were standing up there with bleeding, clothes on fire, and he says, the bullet, bullet must hit you in the leg, he said. Blood coming out of your leg, he says, you were in shock. He says, I reached up, and I didn't remember this, he said, I reached out and pulled you down the patio. Now, I remember hitting the rice pad. That's right. Then, but that other part, I, I went blank with. I said, you're kidding. He says, yeah. He said, I tried to get that hand pistol belt off. He says, the, the heat was so intense when, when it hit that it melted your nylon belt underneath the pistol belt. And, he, you know, the red GI belt. He said, we got it off, though. I said, I don't remember that. And he, but I remember getting off, and then the rest of the platoon used us like a point on a wedge. Tank, tank, caliber 50s going crazy and everything, firing on both sides, because they were, they opened up with everything they had. We had stumbled on a battalion assembly area, or a battalion, uh, battalion or enemy battalion, um, uh, enemy position where they were waiting for us to come the right way, because this was the seventh day we were sweeping around this, and they were watching how we were doing it. Had we been in a line, like we had the other six days prior, 
They wouldn't have gotten us like this. But we were in a hurry as we did in a column, which was a mistake. So the next thing I know, the, the, uh, the track, the medic, uh, his name was Don Wilson, he uh, they came around, opened the back door, they jumped out. Those guys jumped out and grabbed us. My platoon sergeant was burnt in the face and the shoulder. He said, um, um, our loader was just bleeding all over the place. He got most of the shot. It was just, they threw us on the back of the ACAP. I remember in the ACAP, here the medics working on, the guy was bleeding the most. His name was Grossman, uh, Dennis Grossman. And he was plugging them up and putting all the bandages on. Meanwhile, the ACAP was rocking back and forth. And we could hear bullets hitting, hitting the ACAP. And my platoon sergeant, very robust guy, I mean, we looked at him like was, he was our father. He was like, we were in our 20s, he was like 33, and to us he was an old man. He yelled up at the two uh, cargo hatch gunners, because all the hot brass was falling down. Hey, cut that out! That brass is coming down on us! And I looked at my platoon sergeant, and I said, what the hell with that? I said, we'd rather have an RPG come ripping through the side of this thing, sergeant. <laughs> We wound up going and loggering maybe 200 yards away from my tank and I was starting to boo up and burn. And it happened so quick. The back of the egg cab that I was on, they dropped the ramp. And I got out, I was totally naked except for jungle boots. And I asked one of the guys, I was in shock, I asked one of the guys for a cigarette. Oh, that, you know. I'm standing there naked, smoking a cigarette. And, and my, our platoon medic was so good, he said, you'll be all right. He says, let me give you this. And he didn't give me no morphine or nothing. He said, years later, he told me, I didn't give me morphine. Back at the division, um, at back hospitals, they may have given me more morphine, that would have killed you. Mm -hmm. So in fact, he saved my life in that way. And uh, here comes the chopper to take us out. And uh, just before I got in the helicopter, the door gunner leans out and says, you can't put that cigarette out. You know, so I did. And I wound up, that was the last time I was standing up for months. So, and, and then it was a long process to go back hospital. I remember that when the, I was starting to feel burn on me. By the time the chopper landed at the back hospital, and they made me lay on a, a litter from where I was sitting to laying down. And I remember looking up, and, and the litter was put on one of these roller beds, I guess. And I looked up and I saw um, a couple of women, nurses, but doctors, and I had this one guy, the uh, the caduceus or whatever that medical symbol is, and the captain's bars, and they're rolling me, and I went, I remember head first, went through doors, and it was cold so hot. And as soon as we went through the doors, I was screaming and yelling on my left and right, and what it was was the division casualties, the American division for the day. And they rolled me over down and up against the wall, and this guy comes over to me, and I had dog tags, I'm not dog tags, and he asked me my name. I said, my name is this, Sergeant Hurley, blah, blah, blah. He said, and meanwhile, one guy's taking off my high school wing, cutting it off. Another guy's cutting my boots off. Next thing I know, I, they, they took a, a, a tag and tied it on my toe. Now, I remember as a kid, Dick Tracy, the old Dick Tracy comes, he's always see a body, you know, in the morgue and the foot sticking out of the shelf, and I had a tag on his toe. I said, hey, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> I don't need that damn tag. Yeah. Meanwhile, I started to really, really get uncomfortable. I was really starting to burn anywhere. And uh, he said, I don't worry about it. It's just, it's just procedure. It's just, yeah, procedure. This is my dog tag right here. I mean, this is my name. And I was lying with him and I saw my platoon sergeant over there. His face was still burned and he says, Early, he says, you'll be all right. I said, no, I, I just, it's all happening so fast. What the hell happened? And all of a sudden, he hit me. I started to catch on fire everywhere. It was just, what was what had happened to me is catching up to my mind. And my brain is finally realizing, you know, I remember having all this torn skin all over me. And I thought, hey, your mind goes back to when you were a kid. You have seven layers of skin. I thought you had a couple of layers blown off in the explosion. It wasn't blown off, it burnt. And uh, the last thing I remember is, I, I started to get up screaming. And if somebody grabbed me, and it was somebody in a white, white jacket, white, uh, probably a lab coat or whatever. But again, I saw the captain's bars, and I saw the medical symbol on the other side. They grabbed me a hip here with the neck and put me down. And he looked at my face, and he said to me, shut up, 
there are guys worse off here than you. I'll never forget that. You see, I know I, I was gone. Somebody must have been giving me a shot or something at the same time because I was going to get up. There's nothing I could do about yeah. But I never want to go through that one again. But that was in Vietnam, back in Chu Lai, the division of the year. According to my records, because within hours I was flown out to Japan, and my records say I was there for two weeks, for two flights to Brook General Hospital down in Texas, the Burn Center. And I, I couldn't make the first one because I was so bad, according to my records. And, and uh, talk about hallucinating. I, you know, I, every, my brain is telling me why I'm on fire. I kept getting hit, or I was thrown into a fire, or I, I was in an explosion, or, or the aircraft I was on, or an aircraft came down and crashed on top of the tank. Your brain is doing this over and over again. It's just never ending. Whatever they were giving me, it wasn't working. It wasn't separating me from the pain. And then finally I got to the flight to uh, Texas. I was there about nine months, nine months, ten months. And it was, once the skin finally healed, the burning stopped, and then it was a matter of skin graft, skin graft, taking the skin from one side and putting the other. And um, it was uh, something else. In my later days there, I was determined to stay in the Army. I didn't, I wasn't finished. I went to Nam to get combat experience on a tank from Germany. And of course, I didn't have a chance. When I was able enough to, my medical boards were reviewed, they wound up finding me 100% disabled and to be discharged immediately. And permanently retired at 20 years old. And so I, I appealed the decision. And three days later, I'm standing there with a lieutenant who's acting as my attorney. I'm standing there in a pajamas and a robe with a cane, with an arm brace and a leg brace. I didn't have a leg stand. I told him I could recover and I could work with tanks again. No, there's no way. The board, there was three officer members and they said, no, they just thumbs down. They're going home. Sent me back home to Brooklyn, New York. Well, 21 months later, I came back in and that was with the help of my congressman and came here in the armor school being an instructor. That's what they were doing with the guys that were wounded. They're doing that now. A lot of real bad wounded guys. Sent them to service schools to, to try to relay the experience they had. And, um, I did another 18 years in tanks. Armor school to Germany, different tank to tanks, back and forth. And here I am. I mean, I retired after 22 years and <clears throat> haven't stopped playing a soldier. <laughs> you know, but that's, that day was something else. Uh, we just recently lost um, our platoon medic. A great guy. He was the eighth one in my platoon from Vietnam that died of cancer. And it was an internal cancer that killed him. He was a wonderful person. He, uh, we all went to him. We had any kind of ailments or anything, and he was the one who always had an answer. Always tried to get whatever pills, or whatever it was for us. You know, we called him. His name was uh, I know probably not good that name, Don Wilson. But we were taught over there, don't call the medic Doc or medic. Well, we can call him Don. But we had a bunch of other Dons in the platoon. But on his helmet, he had his girlfriend's name, Nancy. So we called him Nancy. We figured if we were hit by laying out there and we're yelling for Nancy, the enemy would go, what the hell was Nancy? You know? <laughs> so we've known him from all that time over there, and then from then on, from that point on. His wife, he married her when he got home. Whenever I called him, I said, hey, Nancy, where's the other Nancy? <laughs> yeah. But that, <clears throat> I'm in touch with some of the other guys in Opportunity. So we have a reunion, reunion organization that's on even on Facebook now. Yeah, so um, there, um, it would be first of the first, first of the first cab uh, reunion, and that's the page. And then you can see all our entry paper pictures that we had from back then, all in there. <clears throat> but uh, I, you know, we're not the only. We're just thinking of thousands of guys that went over there, and somehow you know we're a bunch of us are still kicking around and still have our mind. Supposedly. Now, I, I retired in 89. Here it is 2017. In the meantime, I worked for the city of Erica for 14 years. And all of my time from 77 on, while I was still in Pat Museum, I was always active with the Pat Museum for the World of Touring and Acting stuff. 
And even today, we have a big East Front battle coming up in October out by we call piking grass, Pikeville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love a machine gun with my AG next to me and the other guys carrying ammo cans into these mock battles, you know, blanks and everything else. We all, all of us main actors know each other. It's kind of like Civil War. Hmm. All the Civil War guys know each other. We know in the World War II world each other too. We have guys that have private, they own tanks, T-34, mm -hmm. the German Panzer three, the motorcycles, the Kuba wagons, I mean, we just, I and mean, that's what Alice knows here that, that I do on the side. We play, we play war. So wives, all our wives say, you play a war. You can't get over it. We can get over it. You know, why can't war be like this when nobody really dies? Nobody gets war. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's what I do. I don't know if this is going to interest anybody. Yes, it is. <laughs> I can tell you it definitely is. Um, I don't know how to thank you. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's the young guys today that are doing it without a draft. Half our guys are drafted over there. These young fellows that are standing up. I lost my son while in Iraq. He was a West Pointer. He came here to the AOB course of the Army School, met my daughter. They got married two months before 9-11. He went to Fort Hood, she went to Fort Hood room. And he was the XO of A Troop, 1st and 10th Cav. And the 4th Infantry went over in the invasion of Iraq, 2003. And he, he was, he was a brilliant, smart young man. He was trying to pick up the Arabic lingo. He could speak Italian, German, uh, French. And um, I, I, he was number one, number two in his West Point class of 2000. And his whole guys saw him. He, it was, it was just, you know, the, you could see the, the study of his death, one mistake after another, made by this, made by that, all the way leading up to the fateful night. But, uh, he, you know, here he was, just like all the young guys around him wanting to be officers in the Army. <clears throat> just like the young fellows we have today, they'd go in without a draft and they're doing it. I just uh, went around, around Fort Knox, the commissary of the PX Hunter, then you were from, I was going around and thank him. I was looking for that combat patch about right slip. <laughs> you know, and at first, after we lost our son, whenever I'd see the 4th Infantry patch, I'd be talking to this and see all that officer about, I mean, I'm a lot of them know. Yeah, I was with 10th uh, first with 10th Cav. Yeah, I knew Lieutenant Nod. He was a great guy. And all this. Took one of the great guys and the ladies that we lost over there. Thank you for your family sacrifice. Uh, you know, we, everybody's look at all the families that are doing yes. what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, <clears throat> yeah, I'm just on my has been. No, just no, like no. all the old guys, you no. know. We, if you see this world with two veterans, my God, you don't know what they did. Yeah. And those, um, and I'll stop recording.